down in Fort Benning, Georgia, after graduating from Fort Benning, Georgia, as uh, 11 Bravo Infantry, I went to uh, South Korea, spent a year in South Korea with uh, 1st Platoon Alpha Company 1-9 Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division, and after Korea, I um, did a change the duty station and went to Fort Hood, Texas, and I served with 1st Platoon Alpha Company, 2nd uh, Battalion, 5th Cavalry Regiment. Of the First Cavalry Division. So, how were you recruited to the military? What made you decide to join the military? What motivated you? I always wanted to join uh, the military as a young kid. Uh, me and my two other best friends, every time we'd play when we were young, we would always play war, and you know, and I'd be the crazy one running around with toy guns or sticks and everything, and. We all knew that if anybody out of the three of us was going to go into the military, I was going to go into the military. And uh, probably my senior year, as everybody was, um, you know, taking their PSATs and SATs and this and that, I didn't even bother because I knew I was going into the military. And so, surprisingly enough, uh, I was attempting to get into the Air Force first, um, trying to go in for meteorology. Uh, I mean, I always loved weather, but it was just weird where my future took me. I wanted to go to meteorology, and then I changed my mind and wanted to go into the Air Force as um, their version of military police. And uh, one day um, in my ROTC class, there was an Army recruiter there. We started talking, and, you know, he was telling me, you know, what, what do you want to do? And I'm like, you know, I like... You know war movies so you know i like the weaponry and explosives this and that he's like oh you should uh you know try out for the army you know they have that type of stuff and you know kind of influenced me to go into the army and i was going to go in for uh, military police and uh once i finally got um got up to mems um in springfield and you know passed all the uh all the qualifications, this and that, and come time to pick your job. And I was like, all right, you know, I want to be military police. And they said, well, if you want to go military police, uh, the first available date is until September of, uh, I think it was September about 2001. And this was May of 2001. And I wanted to go right away. So I'm like, all right, um, I don't want to wait. So I'm like, well, you know, I like, you know, I like weapons, I like explosives. I like, you know, the, the tough jobs and this and that. And you're like, oh, well, we have infantry. I'm like, okay, I'm sold. You know, let's go, let's go infantry. So, uh, signed up for infantry. And I guess there was like three duty stations that I could pick from. And I couldn't remember all of them but one. I remember one was uh, Korea. So I'm like, all right, you know, 18, why not, you know, go big and just go halfway across the world. So, uh, chose Korea for my duty station and and my I had a really good friend of um, that was in ROTC with me and he he actually joined the infantry too so we both had it was like a battle buddy program I guess so we both had um, the same date to leave for basic which was uh, 9 July of 2001 and so you know we signed you know signed the line and took the oath and you know, went home and told my parents I was going into the infantry and my dad was happy and my mom was not pleased. <laughs> she was not happy at that, but, you know, they, they knew, you know, the military was something I wanted to do and you know, they supported me throughout my whole career in the Army, so. Yeah. Well, tell me about your first days. You, you went to your reception. Yeah. <laughs> There, tell me how, how yeah, well, we, uh, our recruiter, it was kind of sad, uh, you know, that, you know, the day that my recruiter came to pick me up the house, you know, it was kind of emotional. My mom was all crying and everything. <laughs> she cried a lot during my time in the military, but uh, it was emotional. You know, it was, it was like, it was, it was real at that point. You know, I was leaving my, you know, my house, you know, every, everybody in my class, you know, was, you know, some were vacation before they were going, 
to their, you know, two or four year colleges. And here I was, I was, you know, no summer vacation. I was going right, right to basic. So, you know, leaving my family, it was kind of emotional, you know, my mom, dad, and sister. Then you know, my recruiter, uh, he brought me and my friend, Nick. We went to, um, I'm pretty sure we, we uh, got, he drove us, i trying to remember, he drove us to, I want to say, um, in New York. Or somewhere to take a bus. I, I want to say, is there a bus or a flight? No, it was a, a flight. So he drove us to, I want to say, New York, and we flew to, uh, I want to say, Georgia. And once we got to Georgia, uh, we got on the bus that was going to take us to uh, Fort Benning. And, you know, you know, everybody was excited and this and that, and we, you know, drove up and. You know, we finally get to Fort Benning and we get off the bus and, you know, there we first saw the drill sergeants, the, uh, you know, the mean looking drill sergeants, the brown hats and everything. And I think that's when I was like, oh, 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 oh shit, what did I do? You know, it was like, this is the real deal now. You know, but I mean, reception, you know, you get into this big huge uh room and you know, dump all your stuff and that's when they said you know this is what you need for basic anything else um just throw it away you're not going to need it you know and uh we were at reception actually for a while there was a huge backlog of um of people going in and this was before 9-11 even happened you know this was you know, july of 2001 and there was a lot of um, National Guard and Reserve Infantry in there and a lot of active duty infantry. So we we had to uh, wait. So I was at reception probably uh, about three, maybe four weeks. And it was, it was boring because all you did was you slept, you ate, and that was it basically. There was, there was nothing to do. Towards the end, you started to do some uh, physical training. But then you'd uh, you'd see um, the actual infantry um, uh, members running down the roads and everything who was at, actually in basic. But uh, but finally, after about three or four weeks, we finally got um you know say hey you know you guys are going um, to your basic. But uh, yeah, it was it was kind of boring for the reception. There wasn't much going on. Wasn't boring the one basic study. No, no, basic was not. It was not boring. <laughs> okay. Um, so did you, did you, I know you're infantry. Um, did you specialize in anything? Were you um, trained or just the basic infantry training was, that everyone? No, it was just, just basic infantry training. Uh, didn't you jump? You didn't do air, airborne? No, I actually, when I was back in, um, um, I'm signing uh, my contract, I, you know, I said I want to go to Korea and there. And I was like, well, can I go airborne? Because my friend was going to airborne. I'm like, well, can I go to airborne too? You know, jump out of planes. Why not? And they said if I was going to Korea, I couldn't do airborne. So uh, couldn't get the airborne. But uh, anything else is just normal infantry stuff. Uh, we did actually have 11 Charlies there. So if you got picked to be an 11 Charlie, you'd work with the mortars. Um, but I was just a straight 11 Bravo. So it was just the regular you know, weapons and tactics, nothing else. What was the, uh, so you finished basic training and your, your, your OC training, basic yeah. and your IT, and then from there you went to Korea. So what, yeah. what was, what was your, your thoughts on that at the time, you know? From, well, it was, well, it was very interesting because it wasn't, it was very, um, when I was in basic, 9-11 happened. So, you know, that was like a big thing there because as the world changed and America changed, I didn't see any of it. You know, I was in basic. So when I went into basic and when I left, it was just a whole new world. And then I also went for um, the military because after 9-11, um, every base around the world went to Threatcon Delta. I guess that was, you know, you had your full battle rattle on, you know, weapons, and you're constantly patrolling everything. So when I when I got to Korea, they were at 
they just got off a of Threatcon Delta, so they were on the Threatcon Charlie. So when you, you you get there, you just see people patrolling everywhere and a lot of a lot of security. So it was a very different. If I was going to Korea and nine eleven never happened, mm-hmm. but uh, when I first got to Korea, you know, it was it was flew into uh, Osan down way south of the southern part of uh, South Korea, and I just remember, you know, that it was a beautiful country, and uh, you know, it seemed pretty relaxed the way. Um, of all the people and everything, and they bust us up to our, uh, like a reception area, you know, that was nice, uh, it was, um, outside, uh, Camp Casey, mm-hmm. Camp Casey, they, uh, had a really reception, stationed. no, I was, uh, I was actually stationed over in Cap Hovey, there was like a, like a sister camp at Camp Casey, I don't, never really knew why they were two separate camps that were attached by like, you know, five feet of like a little space it was so weird the reception was camp casey then they um they gave us our orders to where we we're going and i went over to camp hovey and um i just know it was it was snowing it was cold you know and, you know first duty station you're always you know you never you just don't know what to expect you don't know you know how the unit is yeah everything was new but uh you know made some made some really good friends and, uh, you know, just, just follow the phone whenever everybody else was doing, you know, you just, you know, find out, you know, what, what are you supposed to be doing, you know, when do you get up, you know, just the so rules. What was your typical day like once you got settled in and it's pretty much your routine? What was your typical day, day well, like? Just in, in yeah, for uh, Korea was, um, you'd get up. Sometime early in the morning, you know, do your uh, physical training. It was a lot of running. I know we used to do like a nine mile run up a mountain. So we had a couple mountains uh, by Camp Hovey and Camp, uh, Camp Casey. And I remember one, they would, uh, we would take uh, the bus over to Camp Casey and get off by the, um, this airborne unit because they had a huge mountain. And so we would, you know, walk up to the base of it and then we would just run. Run up it, and it was, yeah, and they, they, I remember our platoon star saying, yeah, we did, you know, we biked it, and it's a nine-mile ride, so we, we did it, you know, you run all the way up to the top, and you wanted to be first rather than last, because as soon as the last person came, then you'd run down the hill, so you wanted to get there, you know, rather soon to get a little break. So there was some uh, interesting um, activities we did. For physical training in the morning um, after that you know you eat your breakfast and then uh, depending if you were with the bradley's or just uh dismount infantrymen depends uh, where would you go next you go into the motor pool to deal with the vehicles and the vehicle weapons and maintenance or if you went and dealt with um your uh you know your rifles your machine guns and went out to the woods and the training and tactics. You do that all day and most of the night and come back in and then you were released to do whatever, you know, that night was your time. Mm-hmm. Unless you had to uh, do guard duty. Uh, because we were in Korea and it was a, a, they were hosting us, we had to watch out for Koreans coming in to steal stuff. So we had a ammo guard, we had motor pole guard. Uh, Earlier parts of my tour there, when it was right after 9-11, we had a roving patrol where we had to you know, basically walk the whole perimeter of the base, uh, just to make sure you know, the, the fencing's intact and you know, nobody's trying to sneak through. But, oh, I see. But you got to learn a little bit what the Army was like while you were there. And- yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I got to actually go up to the DMZ, too, up that separates North and South Korea. We actually got our unit got picked to uh, do a cook reaction force for a month up there, and that that was you know you, you know the most heavily fortified border in the world, and I got to you know go and see that and 
it's just breathtaking to see the North Koreans and actually step in North Korea because they had, um, there's a building where they have the peace talks. So you go in and the table is, you know, a long table and then it's separated in the middle. And if you pass that, you're technically in North Korean territory. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. I say I was in North Korean territory, but, uh, that was, that was very, very interesting just to see that. And then, but yeah, you know, I got a good taste of what military life was like and you know, everything. I mean, it's slightly different, obviously, you know, South Korean, uh, Bay state side, you know, different rules and rec uh, regulations. You had to deal with, um, the South Korean nationals and you know all that stuff but it was a good like you know this is what the army is and I loved it it was good well so after Korea from Korea you went to Fort Hood yes and uh, so tell me how that transpired you wanted Fort Hood and, and what unit you were in and, and what you were doing there after yeah, after Korea um Basically, you got to pick your duty station. Uh, if you if you did a one year um, hardship tour, I know you, you got um, to pick your duty station. So it was like you know, let me go to Fort Hood. I hear good things about it. So I got I got approved. So went to Fort Hood. I just remember um, getting picked up at the, the um, air. Um, it was right outside of Clean. They had a air an airfield right outside of there. And, uh, I got picked up and I'm driving through Fort Hood. I was just like amazed by you know the size of the base. And I'm like, how am I ever gonna find my way around this base? Because it, it was just huge. Obviously later on, I got pretty good at you know, driving around base, but it was just huge. Uh, once again, went to reception and uh, maybe there for a week or two. And got set to my unit. You know, get to that unit, and that, you know, it's it's you know different because you know. You know, it's your state side, you know, there's obviously different rules, it's different units, so, you know, people are different, and the mission's different, but uh, I fit right in. Once again, went to uh, First Platoon Alpha Company of uh, 2-5 Cav, and uh, it was basically almost like Korea to where, depending if you're um, a Bradley person or a, a dismount person, it depended on uh, your weapons and tactics and uh, I was a dismount for a while doing all that and uh, then uh, right before Iraq maybe a couple months they put me to a Bradley gunner so everything changed now it was uh, maintaining the 25 millimeter main gun the machine gun the tow missile launcher so doing all that so it's kind of different but it was it was fun doing it so as a Bradley gunner you you uh you had control of all three of those weapons. Yeah, all right, right there in your, your cookie word. Yeah, uh, my weapon station was right next to me, so I would have control over all those uh, weapon systems, uh, the turret, everything. Okay. Um, so at Fort Hood, this is, this is the unit you're in now. Mm -hmm. at Fort Hood is the unit that you went to Iraq with. Yes. So. Just tell me a little bit about your, your build up and your preparation yeah. for going because I know it's all pretty intense time yeah. getting ready. And yeah. like, it's not like going on a camping trip, you know, make sure you <laughs> got everything straight. And no. Just tell me a little bit about that. Well, they, we were supposed to be in the invasion, and uh, they actually changed our mission, and they, they um, instead wanted 4th Infantry Division that was on our base as well. Uh, they said that they were they had more advanced equipment and technology, so they were going to send them for the invasion. You know, so we didn't go right away, uh, but then we finally got our orders. You know that hey, we're going to be going to Iraq. They sent us to the National Training Center in California for a one month preparation. Uh, you know, at the yeah. time, NTC. Yes, at the time it was, you know, it was training for Iraq. But once you got to Iraq, and once we saw. What we did over there it was it was not the best training at all. You know, it was, you know, they, I mean, they tried what they they they, they could do, but uh, it was for what we did over in Iraq. It was not 
not good training, but then again, how can you really train for war? You can't. But I mean, give us some good tips. I uh, went back, um, got our, you know, our final orders that said, yes, we are going to Iraq. You know, and they finally told us where we were going. They said, we are going to be going to Sadr City in eastern Baghdad. I remember this. They said, you know, it is going to be the safest places in Iraq, but it is going to be the dirtiest. And annoyingly to us, they were wrong about one, you know, it was the dirtiest, but it was also wasn't going to be the safest. So it was going to be one of the dangerous places we we're going to. So, you know, I tell my parents, hey, you know, we're going to Iraq. But, you know, I told them what we were told, you know, it's the safest place. You know, so don't, you don't have to worry about us. You know, it's going to be dirty, but, you know, we'd rather it be dirty than dangerous. Um, so hopefully that eased my, you know, my parents and my sister's, you know, worries about me going to Iraq. But, uh, you know, you know, it's just packing up all our stuff, you know. Uh, we sent most of our stuff ahead of us because they had to go by train and by ship. So they wanted it to get to Kuwait, you know, relatively you know, sooner than later. So we didn't have to wait for it. So we sent all of our stuff and then I know... <laughs> The last couple of nights in their barracks was just wild, you know, people going crazy and drinking and everything. You know, and I, re I remember this, we had a huge formation, you know, and a lot of people were thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to go to Iraq, let me, you know, do drugs and this and that. And I remember we are at this huge formation, our battalion commander, you know, Colonel Valesky, who was just, at the time he was Lieutenant Colonel, just a phenomenal leader. I remember to him, he's like, you know, if you uh, think you're going to be doing, you know, getting out of this deployment by doing drugs, he's like, you're wrong. So if you want, you know, smoke your weed because you're going to Iraq. You know, I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> you know, I'll say, hey, you're not getting out of it. You're coming. <laughs> no matter what, you're going to be coming. You might be, you know, cleaning the shitters for most of your deployment, but you're coming. You know, um, I said... People were, you know, just doing their thing. Like, last couple nights, getting wild and crazy. I think the MPs came a couple times. But, you know, finally we, uh, you know, we left. Uh, we left to Kuwait. Flew over as a unit. Yep, we flew over. I can't remember uh, how big. I, I know our, at least our, um, I think we went as a battalion. We definitely went as a company on the plane. Uh, we flew, yeah, flew over to uh, Kuwait first. Um, they had, they call it, um, you gotta get used to the the desert and ever yeah, and everything. Uh, I know, like a lot of people were depressed just because you're, you know, you're in the desert. There's absolutely nothing to do. You're bored. You know, and it was funny because we got to Kuwait. We had a briefing. They're like, listen, you're now in the war zone, and you know all that stuff. And it's like war zone, huh? Well, not much going on. It's Kuwait. I think we were there for a couple weeks before we finally got uh, sent to uh, Iraq. And um, we actually were told we were going to convoy up from Kuwait all the way up to uh, Cyber City, where we we're going to be. You know, and you know that was a you know a huge build up. You know, we're like hey, we're you know we're finally going to Iraq and this and that. So. You know, get the convoy in this huge line, and uh, they needed somebody to uh, gun on this uh, the the communications Humvee. So they said, "Hey, for sure, well, you can do it." Like, All right, whatever. Yeah. So we go, and this Humvee was like bare bones. It was they had no armor, no nothing. It was like, you know, the it, it almost looked like a um, exoskeleton of a Humvee. You know, I had to hook myself up to this metal rod in the middle of the, the back of the Humvee and had the 240 up there, and that, that was it. That was, I was like, wow. And everybody's like, hey, good luck. You know, because I had absolutely no protection. Wow. Like, whatever. This is what it is. So we, you know, we just, we started going up, and this, I think it took us three days to get to our, um, 
to where we needed to go. Uh, we crossed over in Iraq, if I can remember from my journal, um, I want to say March 31st, we crossed into Iraq, I want to say. Um, and that was a big thing. You could see, like, going up to, towards the border, um, huge sand dunes and where the engineers breached. And uh, you know, just um, a lot of concrete barriers with a lot of previous units, uh, graffiti and stuff. And, you know, we're just going up in Iraq. And from the time we hit Iraq to Saudi City, we took absolutely no fire, nothing. It was a very peaceful ride. You know, you see a lot of Iraqi kids waving and a lot of family families there just waving and I said no fire, no nothing. And uh, this was, you know, um, one of the peaceful times in Iraq. You know, we had an invasion, the invasion was done. Um, so the insurgency was starting to boil, but it, had, it hadn't reached that eruption point yet. So everything was very calm um, and most of the country. And I think we got to our base about, I want to say, April 1st. We finally got to uh, our, uh, our base, uh, Camp Eagle. Near, near in Cider City? Yeah, it was right outside of Cider City. They actually, um, there was a cab unit that was there before us, and there was this camp they had that was... Um, in the city, uh, Camp Marlboro, it's like a cigarette factory. That's where they were. And then they pulled back um, maybe like a quarter of a mile and they built another base. You know, And when we were getting there, they were building barracks in the base for us. So, you know, we we're sleeping in tents and uh, the motor pool and the, there's like a maintenance bay we're sleeping in there too. Anywhere you can really find any sleep you know we would sleep there <clears throat> so we're you know just anywhere you can find and stay and you know it was April 1st so we didn't really do anything the, about the next day of, I want to say yeah April 1st April 2nd we didn't really do anything uh, just got used to um, where we were um, trying to talk to the other guys that were there about, you know, what was going on. And they said, no, nah, there wasn't really anything going on in the city. Uh, unbeknownst to us, the only time they took, um, they rolled into the city once, they got, uh, a couple of guys were killed and they just never went back in the city. They kind of just stayed back. Uh, 2-2 ACR, I want to say that was the unit, 2-2 ACR. So and they, the armored cavalry, right? yeah, yep. And, uh, so what they did and what we did following our combat was totally different. They stayed out where we would just, uh, we would take over the city and show them who's boss. But uh, maybe we heard a couple mortars in the distance. Uh, but the first maybe a couple days, it was, uh, there was nothing going on. It was very calm. Just the first couple days. Yeah. It was, you know, our first uh, couple days patrolling. Um, we go out, and the first thing we noticed was that the sewage, was raw sewage over the, the whole city, basically. And oof, we drove the first time smelling it, and we almost threw up. It's just uh, nauseating. We're just driving through, though, and you know, we're like, oh, okay, this is going to be your job. Yeah, it's very dirty, but it's very, very peaceful. We're driving around, and everybody's waving to us. Kids are coming up, this and that. So we're like, oh, we can do this for a year, you know, just. Just, uh, you know, like it was almost, you know, pass out water and food and medical supplies and just drive around and then come back in. And that was it. But we, what we didn't know was uh, we didn't know about Fallujah, about the, um, the Blackwater, the four Blackwater guys that were killed and sh mutilated, strung up. We didn't know about that. Uh, we didn't know about um, Asadr, who ran the Mahdi army. We didn't know about him and that we closed down his um, newspaper um, bureau and were, you know, cracking down on him. Like, we didn't know. I guess uppers, the uppers did, but we didn't know about 
off any of this. You know, so that that just you know changed everything. The insurgency uh, hit on April fourth. So those things, those those the blue jay and the, the, the Blackwater mm. contractors that were killed, it's all were just kind of leading up yep. to this this full blown insurgency that erupted. We, we didn't know obviously the oil. All of us that were, you know, just, you know, the lower ranks, we didn't know any about any of this. We just, you know, we just knew about, you know, our patrols and all that. And we're like, oh, this is, you know, easy. We can do this. This is nothing, you know. But we didn't know the storm that was coming. So, so the first few days were uh, kind of like a, felt kind of like a humanitarian mission. Yep. And, uh, you didn't know about those events that were happening in other areas of the country. So what? What was your wake up call? What was your <clears throat> holy cow? There's there's more going on. There's something yeah. going on here that isn't quite uh, what we thought. I think it, it was a. Uh, I think April third, April third, while we were um, we were, you know doing checkpoints and this and that, and uh, we just saw these bus loads and dump truck loads of people coming through, and it was mighty. It was the the mighty army militia coming into Cider City, and they were planning something big, but we didn't know about it. We just, you know, waving out and this and that, and they were coming in, um, the colors were green and black. So that's all we could see were just, you know, just all these mighty army coming in. We didn't know who they were, you know, we're just like, oh, look at them, just waving and stuff, you know, but they were all coming in April 3rd, and uh, or April 4th is when it erupted all over the country. Um, we actually had our uh, change of command ceremony on April 4th. We took over um, our area of operations from 2-2 ACR. We had that, and um, we had a, uh, um, a platoon from Charlie Company was out on patrol and uh, they're escorting some, I want to say they're called the honeydew tankers. It might be for the sewage or whatnot. They were out there and then uh, they took fire. And uh, you know, from this point, before that, it was, it was always peaceful and they were taking fire. Uh, I want to say that one of their gunners was hit and was killed and so they were trying to leave the city, get back to base, and they were cut off. Uh, the Mighty Army set up this complex um, ambush. Uh, they were um, they were blocking all the routes, so you couldn't get out. Their um, garbage was just being put in, burned into tires. The stuff that you would see in Black Hawk Down blocking the roads they were doing in Cider City. So they were actually cut off from um, our base. And as far as I can remember, they took up um, their shelter in a building. They took over a building, uh, secured a roof, uh, both the alleyways to get into the, the building. And they just, you know, called for help. Um, my my uh, platoon, we were on uh, QRF the quick reaction force for that day. So um, we got this call that, you know, there, are, there, was, there was some help needed. And so we're like, all right, we're, you know, we got ready. And then we were told to stand down. So, okay, we're gonna stand down. We didn't know what was going on. And then, and then this came this huge emergency call. I remember this, you know, people are just running around, racing everywhere. You know, we line the vehicles up, people are still running around, what's going on? Come and find out, they were like, oh, you know, uh, there's um, a huge multiple firefights going on in the city. Um, all the police stations were taken over. We're, we have to go out and um, take back the police stations, this and that. There was no mention to me of the, comp uh, the, the platoon that was cut off in the city. So we, we get all lined up and I remember my... Uh, my um, uh, my uh, my squad leader, Sar Hernandez, I remember him. He opened up the door, and I'm sitting, and then to my left was uh, Quasi, who was another soldier. And I remember him saying, hey, 
we have to take the translator. Uh, one of you guys have to go ride an LMTV. You know, and he looked at me, and he looked at Causey, and he's like, Causey, you want to go? And he's like, oh, yeah, no problem. So he went, so we got the translator, and um, we lined up outside of the base we're going, you know. Can't really hear much. Can hear maybe a little gunfire in the distance, but I can't really hear much. And that's when we're like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to go take back these police stations, this and that. Like, All right. You know, we None of us really saw combat before, but, you know, but we didn't know what to expect. So we start we start rolling out. We're going and uh, going towards the city, and there's this huge intersection. It's called, uh, we have Route Silver that goes straight up from our base, keeps going up. And if you, the, the road to the left was Eros. And uh, so we took a left on the Eros and then we stopped, you know, and the city has like 2.5 million people living in it. I mean, it was a small city that has way more people and there was nobody out. We didn't, you know, we're, it's like a telltale sign that we've, uh, we took in throughout our whole tour that if, where we go into the city and there's absolutely nobody around, you're going to get ambushed. You know, because all our other patrols, there's just people everywhere. And, you know, we're going in to the city this time and there was nobody, not a soul. Everybody was just gone. It was like a ghost town. Like, you know, wow, this is weird. You know, nobody's here. What's going on? So we go up to Eros. Um, there's this, another main road. So we took a right on the Eros. We're going. I looked out my window. I noticed that there's just like this Iraqi mother with her two children and they're just kind of huddled and it's like, it was like maybe a building and it had like a, I don't know, like a little porch area and they're just sitting there. I'm just looking at them like, and just the little things you just like pick up that are really scared and this and that. And, and then, you know, then you can hear the gunfire. You know, I'm like, well, you know, I'm... But we were in up our Humvee, it kind of stuck my head out a little bit and just hear like this, um, all this gunfire. And it's like, what, what is going on? And didn't know it at the time, but our lead element was actually getting ambushed. Um, they had uh, militiamen on each side, up on the um, roofs everywhere. And everybody was just taking fire. So we didn't, we weren't there yet, but you know, we just hear all this machine gun fire. We finally we rolled and then we started taking fire. You know, I don't know why. You know, I stuck my head out the window. I mean, <laughs> a stupid thing now. Is, you know, I wanted to see. You couldn't because I couldn't see anything because we were on the right side of the road. So anything up above, I couldn't see. So I stuck a head up and I saw somebody run. And I just I shot up because I had I had a saw. I shot up and you know, who knows what happened? Probably not hit anybody, but and then. Our gunner was Sergeant Apple. He gets hit. He got shot in the back. So I hear him say, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. He just drops down and kind of curls up. He's facing me. Um, and that's and that's all it was. It was just this heavy gunfire. We are going, you know, down Bravo Market. Took more heavy gunfire. And it was basically um, like Black Hawk Down where, you know, Black Hawk Down, they're racing through in Humvees, getting shot at. I mean, that basically was the same thing for us. You know, it was just taking fire on each side. Um, the lead Humvee, uh, their driver was shot multiple times and killed, so the Humvee stopped. So our whole um, convoy basically stopped. Um, the LMTV, which I was supposed to be on if it wasn't for Causey on, he got shot in the leg, you know, and actually most of the people up in the LMVT, um, the LMVT were shot and wounded. You know, they're just lying there. Um, What's the LMVT? It's the, it's almost like a truck. A fl uh, not a flatbed truck, but it's a truck where it can carry um, supplies or troops. It's a lot of times how we would get around if you wanted to uh, move around like, say 10 to 20 soldiers, they just get on to the truck and we drive out. And then we had a couple soldiers up there. Um, rumor was that one of the soldiers actually hit under the dead bodies because, you know, he don't want to get shot himself. Um, so he hit under the bodies instead of actually shooting back. 
Uh, we had one guy, uh, Sergeant Milton Berger, he was a staff sergeant. He actually, uh, he got a silver star because he, he was um, phenomenal up on the LMTV. Uh, it was a couple people that were, were shot, so he was applying pressure to like three people that were wounded and returning fire. So he saved a lot of lives that day. Uh, I know when I was in the home V, Sir Apple was hit. You know, Sir Hernandez was like, "Hey, keep him awake." The the translator was putting pressure on his wound so he wouldn't bleed out because his wound was facing him. So I was, I just kept, you know, yelling at him, shaking him because you know you see his eyes closed and everything. You wanted to keep him awake. You know, then I heard my, I had my saw on the side facing out the window and I heard this crack and um, I looked down and there was like a hole in my glove so I thought you know I was shot and my thumb was gone and it was actually just the bullet hit my weapon and the the metal piece the metal pieces for my weapon and the bullet fragments actually went and took like part of the thumb the tip of it off you know, so I just kind of took my first aid bandage and kind of put it on to stop the bleeding. So I'm holding that and I'm trying to, you know, knock Sarah Hernandez or uh, Sarah Apple, keep him awake. And we're, you know, we're still stopped there, you know, and you see the bullets hitting the, um, the up armored glass and you just see the glass just all of a sudden like crack everywhere because it just stopped the bullet from, uh, um, you know, coming in, which is if we had an just a regular Humvee that didn't have the up-armored uh, windows, those rounds would have came right in and hit us. And uh, we had a Br the Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. We had one up front, and I remember watching it and, you know, dropping the ramp, and they put in um, the driver's body out of the, the Humvee and put his body in there and drove away. And then finally our convoy started to go, and, uh, you know, we went back, finally got back to our base, you know, it was just, that was just, uh, um, just craziness. You know, we get right through, they go right through in front of the battalion uh, medic station. So you're back, you're, you did pull them back in? Yeah, so we get we get to the battalion med station, right? And we pull up right in front and you know, it was just, anybody I could walk got out and then, you know, you're seeing people carry other soldiers that were, were shot or whatnot. I remember seeing Sergeant Ryan. Uh, he had like a, a bandage around his face for his eye. He actually uh, lost his eye. You know, but I remember seeing him. You know, it was one of the, the visuals, and they they sat me down in front of um, the battalion, right out, out in front of the battalion uh, aid station. And, you know, I just saw these like people getting carried in and everything, and. To the left of me, there was a soldier who was dead, but they were working on him. They were, you know, giving him the chest compressions, and his friends just say, you know, come on, come on. And then I remember the doctor saying, you know, well, oh, call it, he's dead, let's move on. So, you know, it was just, just, it was just, you know, like surreal. You know, here I was, 20, you know, I've been in the first firefight, wounded, having people that were dead right next to me. And um, they finally moved me over to another area. They were they were getting the most seriously wounded out of there by um, Black Hawk. And then everybody else that wasn't as serious like me, they were just going to transport over to our um, our brigade base, which had a, a bigger med station. You know, but it was just weird. It was just, you know, surreal just seeing, like, just mass chaos and wounded people everywhere. You know, and they... Um, they uh, we went to a, <clears throat> one of the ambulances. They transported. Uh, we were like one of the last ones to go over to the, the brigade uh, station. So we get there and had the medics work on my hand. And you know it was weird because I could actually, when I looked down, I could actually the skin was peeled back, and you could actually I, I saw my thumb bone. It was white pointy tip. It was just, you know, it was just weird. It was like this is not good. You know, but they they got. You know, they, they threw me up on the table. They gave me some morphine. Felt so good. You know, took that pain away. They started scrumming, they, you know, the cleaning. And I'm like, oh, no, this hurts. This hurts. Shoot me more morphine. <laughs> so they gave me some more morphine. And uh, I was like, all right, I don't feel nothing. Go to town. You know, they sutured it up and everything. And they, they sent us up to a, 
um, to the upstairs, and that's when they had all the cots, and uh, they're just, you know, we were supposed to stay there for a couple of days, and uh, you know, that's when you were, you were exchanging stories about, you know, what we saw, and this and that, and, um, and that's not, like, the one time I had crazy nightmares would have been that night, I mean, I remember it was like, my nightmare was, um, it was just a normal day, but however wounded you got in Iraq, it still showed, but you're walking normal, like Sergeant Ryan, you know, he was walking around normal, but he had like the bandage on and bloody, but it was just like, he was normal walking around, and all of my friends that were shot up, they were just walking around like everything was fine, but you know, their physical wounds were showing, that was the only like major nightmare I had was that night, other than that, didn't really have any crazy nightmares. But yeah, so, and, uh, our brigade command, our brigade sergeant major visited us too, and you know, all of us basically said, "Hey, we want to get into the fight." You know, he was like, "Oh no, you know, you guys need to rest." You know, we have, uh, you know, there's a huge operation going to take back the city, which they did. You know, but we we all wanted to be part of that, but we couldn't because you know we were wounded and had to, uh, you know, recover and everything. Uh, I think. From that one day, uh, we had over 50 wounded and we had, I want to say, between five and seven killed. Uh, we killed we from our company. I think there was also uh, somebody like from um, our artillery unit that was killed. So it, was just, it just wasn't all um, Elf Company and Charlie Company that were killed. There were some guys from other units that went out that were killed too. You know, but it just turned into a, a nightmare. And you know, it turned into one of the deadliest places. But, so, this is when it began. I mean, was was from here? Did it go on for a while? Where where, where you're? Yeah. I'm sure you guys were sort of having new patrols again, and, and were there still stuff going on with these patrols? Or because you said they did take the city back. I mean, oh yeah, it, kind of sort of took it back. Did they actually end up taking it back pretty quickly? And, mm -hmm. We, we took over the city. We took it back. We went, we, you know, we, we fought off. From what um, I was told, uh, our unit took over all the police stations, and then they, you know, held the police stations. They were uh, um, attacked at that night, April 4th that night. They were attacked, and they just held them off. And then from April 4th on, as I said, countrywide, it was a full-blown insurgency you had. Uh, the Marines fight, fighting in uh, Fallujah and Ramadi, and you had us fighting in Sadr City. You had them fighting down in Basra. You had us fighting up north in Bakuba. So they are fighting all over, but for us, it was just sustained. Um, we fought for the next three months, all of April, May, and June, and it was um, we would get mortared day and night. They would lob mortars at us, especially at night. Uh, we would go out on patrols, and uh, we would usually get ambushed. Uh, we would go out sometimes. It was a combination of um, up-armored Humvees, light-skinned Humvees, and some Bradleys for support. And after a while, we just told them we weren't going out in um, uh, light-skinned Humvees because you know it was getting too dangerous. You know, you get an IED that would go off, or you get um, ambushed by RPGs and machine gun fire, and you know you didn't have the up armor survivability, so you would just take mass casualties every time you go out light skinned. Uh, but you know we were always fighting back. You know we would always go out on patrols, turn into an ambush. We would you know get out of the the you know, kill zone, but we would lay down firepower to suppress the enemy. Uh, we were always doing um, raids at night. You know, we go out, and they were smart though, because you go if there's a patrol that was going out or radio was going out, you'd see flares go up in the uh, city. So they were always watching us too. They were, like, you know, they would see you know this huge convoy coming into the city, so the Mahdi army would sh shoot flares up so to warn you know everybody else. Hey, there, you know, there's a convoy coming in, like green and red. So you know, they were smart too. But those raids, I remember one raid I was on, and uh, I was a gunner, and uh, was, when we still had our light skin Humvees, we were still using, I was gunner in one of them. I was like, wow, we're going to do a raid, and 
we get ambushed and here I am pretty vulnerable. But we, we took a couple guys in and we, we left and not one shot was fired. So somebody was looking out for us that day. Not one round was fired and you know, we took a couple targets in. But <clears throat> there were other raids where we were on and it, it wasn't, um, we weren't so lucky. We would, uh, you know, we'd be sitting and all of a sudden just all hell would break loose. We would, you know, get incoming rounds machine gun rounds RPGs and we just all would shoot out at the targets. Um, <coughs> I know um, one raid we went out on, uh, we're out there for a while, we're getting, uh, you know, we're getting hit pretty good, you know, RPGs and machine gun fire and that's when uh, Sergeant E stuff was hit. He took a piece of an RPG that uh, took off most of his leg. His leg was just holding on by uh, little pieces of meat. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, there was like, a lot of controversy over this because we, you know, he was wounded and we were waiting so long to get him out of there. You know, so a lot of, there was a lot of, like, um, I guess, anger towards higher ups. Why, why we didn't get out of there earlier? Why we didn't call him a medevac or anything? I mean, you know, he ended up dying, but there's a lot of questions over that, you know. I mean, I, I think, I guess that happens with, like, anybody that's killed, you know, something like that. You always question everything because you don't want to lose anybody. Um, well, wait, so were you, uh, were you, like, pinned down and they, you couldn't move them out? You needed, some, you needed help to come in to get well, I, I don't even think we were, I mean, we were taking fire, but, I mean, I don't know exactly why we didn't leave as soon as, you know, he was hit and it was, you know, a serious, you know, injury by, you know, sending a small element to race back to the base to get a meta back out or whatnot. Uh, I don't even think we're ever told the answer. I just know there's a lot of a lot of anger as to why we didn't leave. But you know, sometimes the stuff happens. So. Okay. Um, so you you were there. Were there any other incidents uh, where that were highly the top of your mind, it was yeah, uh, every time I was wounded, it was stressful. Uh, April 4th, I was ever said that about that with the, the thumb. Um, there was another time where uh, I was a Humvee gunner and we were uh, going back to base. And uh, when you know you're going to be ambushed, that's that's like the most stressful time that. I think I've ever had in Iraq. We were uh, out at a police or, or out at a school, and then we heard like AK rounds, you know, like a little small burst, and then we heard another small burst, and everybody just vanished. We we're going back to base anyway, and we we're like, oh well, you know, everybody's clearing out, the streets are clearing out. You can hear the AK rounds, so we're like, all right, we're gonna be ambushed, and that's like the most nerve wracking thing. You don't know when it's gonna happen. Or where it's gonna come from, or anything. So we're we're just driving down, and I'm I have my section. So you know I'm I'm aiming, and we go down Route Silver, which was this. It was always covered in trash, and, and we're always told not to go down it because there are always IEDs out down Silver. Easy to hide them because the whole road is just filled with trash. Why we went down that route, I don't know. We weren't supposed to. But we did, and there was an IED that went off um, underneath my home V. So, you know, one second you're facing there, and the next second, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking up. You know, I'm laying in the home V, and I'm looking up. You know, and I remember hearing the, the explosion, and the first thing that um, went through my mind was, you know, you know, I'm going to die. You know, this is this is it. You know, we just had a bomb go off. I'm, I probably lost my legs. So I'm like, wow, I'm 20, not even 21, and I'm going to die in this godforsaken country. You know, so the first thing you do after something like this is you always do your um, your fingers and toes check. So, you know, I was like, okay, I got my fingers. You know, you move your fingers, and then you, uh, you look down at your feet. You know, as nerve-wracking as that is, make sure... You still have legs. I looked down and I had them. So I'm like, all right, this is good. I moved your feet. I move my feet. I'm like, all right, I, I move my feet. So, you know, I'm, I'm good. 
what happened was when the bomb went off, a lot of the shrapnel just went up and, and hit me in the face and my shoulder and my neck. And that's when the, the face started bleeding and uh, it was small little um, wounds, small little, but it bled so much. It was just coming in uh, in my eye and my mouth. So you know, I'm trying to like spit blood out and can't see out of one eye because of the blood. And the Iraqi to my left, we had uh, one of the Iraqi soldiers with us. He took a huge uh, piece of metal right through his back. So he was just kind of sitting there, not really doing much. And uh, their vehicle was dead. The, the IED just destroyed the underneath of the Humvee. You know, so we were just stuck there. So the Bradleys, we had two Humvees and two Bradleys. The Bradleys had to come back because you know, when it happened, dust everywhere, they, they went right by us. They had to come back, pull security, and get us in. So we're in the Humvee and, you know, trying to calm the Iraqi down because our, our medic was trying to put an IV in, into him when we were driving back to base in the Bradley and, uh, you know, just trying to calm him down. And it was just like, you know, here he is, he might die. You know, he, he doesn't really speak English. You don't really speak Iraqi, but you're trying anything you can just to, just to calm him down. And you know, we finally got back to base. Uh, the medics were working on him. The other medics were working on me. They had to take a piece of a rock out of my neck, uh, some of the shrapnel from my shoulder and such. You know, and, you know, I was fine, just, you know, uh, besides a concussion, um, I was fine. But the Iraqi soldier, he ended up dying that night, so he never made it, which, you know, which kind of sucked. Because when I, rem I remember when we were going out on the patrol, he, like, you know, I was up there as a gunner, and, he, you know, he was, you know, slapping my, my foot and giving me thumbs up and smiling and everything. He was, like, ready to go. And, you know, I just, you know it was really sad that, you know, he didn't make it, you know. Uh, that was that time, uh, another stressful time, um, it's uh, another time I was wounded, uh, this is when I was a, a Bradley gunner, and we were, uh, I always thought the Bradleys were invincible, you know, I was like, hey, we got, so basically, a you know, a fortress, a steel, and we had a reflexive armor around it, and it was boxes full of C4, so when a RPG hit the box, it would blow up. The C4 would ignite and blow the RPG back out. And uh, we were driving down on our convoy, going right back to base on Eros. And some RPG gunner just shot, and it it was a good shot because it went right below the the reflexive armor. It hit our uh, regular armor, went right through the Bradley, and blew up inside. You know, so you know. I had a concussion, you know, I was thrown back a little. I looked over at Sergeant Hernandez, he was like passed out, so you know, slapped him, woke him up, you know, and everything. And where the turn is in front is where the ammo and everything, you can just see this fire going on. So we all left the Bradley, because we thought it was just gonna engulf, you know, with the ammo going off. So we left to the other Bradley, and we were standing there, and Nothing was really happening. There was a small fire, and, and you know, so I was like, "Oh, let's go put out the fire." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, let's go." And, you know, I'm not even thinking about it. You know, it might blow up or anything. So we just run back, take the fire extinguishers, and put out the fire. You know, and uh, we just drove it back. Our uh, driver, uh, uh, specialist Kerrigan, we just drove it back. Uh, we got it back to the mortar pool, so we, we got off and we're looking at it. We can see the hole where it went in, and and when you're um when you're in the Bradley, you have these special helmets that have microphones so you can talk to each other. So our driver's regular helmet was behind them, and what none of us knew was that when the RPG hit, it went right behind them, went through his helmet, and blew up inside. So he he had his helmet where. He had to get a new helmet because his helmet, there was an RPG hole through, you know, you both of them. Yeah, the Kevlar CBC. helmet. Not the Kevlar helmet. So he had a CVC on it, but the Kevlar helmet. You see the, the RPG that went right through it. So he got to keep it and take it home. But it was just like, it's real. If that RPG went a little more to the left, it would have killed him. Maybe about a foot or two to the left, it would have killed him. But so when that hit the vehicle, you were in the gunner's hat? Yeah, I was up in the gunner's. Yeah. 
I just probably, probably the best place to be at that time. Yeah, yeah. unless the RPG gets you in the turn, but yeah. I don't think it happened to anybody. That that one, whew, it's a close call. Well, um, did you have any any other incidents that were uh, you want to talk about while you were there that were high stress or? Um, injured again? Hopefully not. No, nah, it was the three times. The three times I was injured, and that that, that was it. Enough, right? Yeah, it was like we had this like thing going on. It was uh, me and there was this another sergeant. And every time one of us would get wounded, a little time later another one of us would get wounded. So it was like a back and forth thing. <coughs> Thankfully, that that was it. You know, I was wounded three times, and he was wounded two or three times, and that was it. You know, and our brigade commander was tired of seeing me up there putting purple hearts on me. I was like, oh, another one? He's like, we need to keep you, you know, want to keep you, uh, you know, safe. I was like, I'm trying, sir, you know. And, but um, I know I was up in, uh, up in the tower sometimes when you get mortared, you know, that. You got to watch out. I was up there one time. And, you know, you hear the you can hear the mortars being dropped, and then you know, just in the, in the tower, and you know, you just hear the mortars going off around you, and you're like, oh. what you can do is just pray and make sure one doesn't land right on your tower. But uh, that um, anytime you're walking out in the, on the base and you get mortared, uh, you just basically you just run and try to find the nearest cover. You know, like I said, the uh, you can usually hear them being launched from their tube. Well, sometimes if they're that far away, you don't. And it's just, you hear one explode and then you just run to your nearest cover and uh, make sure you, you don't get hit. But uh, other than that, it was just, any anything going out in the city was high stress. <laughs> Every time, because you, you never knew if, you know, you never knew if that was gonna be your last you know, your last time going out, you go out and it's like, well, you know, you're going to get, see some heavy combat that day, but it's like, is this going to be my last day or not? But most of the time I was a Bradley gunner, so I felt kind of safe because I was in a Bradley, you know, but always going out and just getting contact all the time, you know, getting hit by an IED that would go off. You didn't know if that was going to be the one that, you know, just destroys your home, your Bradley, or you know, you take an RPG. You know, I don't know, but it, it was uh, it was always high stress going out there. As I said, it, you'd get you'd hit contact day and night, no matter when you went you went out, nonstop. When you were uh, in your your cantonment or your, your camp area, when you went on patrols, did you feel fairly safe there, or was that also had some stress because you were under attack and one saw it throwing lobbing mortars or, or, um, or, or do you feel pretty safe there? For the most part I felt safe. I mean yeah you know you know you never knew if you're gonna mortar but a lot of times you felt safe. You know you know <clears throat> once in a while there's a rumor oh the mighty army is gonna try to breach the the base and this and that and you know we would take it seriously so uh, stuff like that we would we'd have your um, guards on your tower, but then you would also have people up on the roof. You'd have a, like a platoon up on your roof and have your machine gun set just in case, you know, they would, but they, they never, never attempted to attack our, our base. Uh, once in a while, they would shoot RPGs at the towers and whatnot, but or not, no, you know, I mean, I felt safe sometimes. I would go running around the base that night, you know, so I'd run. Yeah, I was like, yeah, you know, I might hit mortar, but it's like, no, I want to run. So you just run around. So. Okay, so you were, you were there for six months or a year. A year. A year. Yeah. And it was pretty much the same, the same cycle. I mean, there's always the stress of doing patrols yeah. and, and encampment. It wasn't too bad. You were a little bit yeah. relaxed. Yeah. Relaxed. It depends. I mean, it was such a high operation tempo that we were doing. Um, I would usually do two, three days without sleep. I mean, you would just go on pure adrenaline, you know, because it would be you patrol during the day, 
and do you know maybe a, a checkpoint or a, a, you know a handout of water and food to some people or check out police stations. And then at night you would do this huge raid, so you wouldn't get any sleep. You would be preparing, every get everything set, go out on your huge raid. You know, get your con, you know, get into contact and whatnot, get your high value targets, kill some enemies, and then you come back. And it'd be like six in the morning and you're like, oh, well, I'm up. Let me eat some breakfast, you know, because I have another mission to do in a couple hours. So you wouldn't really sleep because you'd be up. You know, so you do your mission, you know, throughout your whole day and you go on another raid at night. So it would just repeat itself for like two, three days. And finally you had your day off and you just, you slept half the day because you were so exhausted. You know, that, um, going out at nights, I mean... Sometimes you're so exhausted, I mean, you know, you're just trying to stay awake and, and you know, sometimes you'd fall asleep, sometimes you wouldn't. But whenever you'd hear that boom from an ID or RPG, the adrenaline would just spike in your system and you'd be up. And, you know, you would just be, you find your targets, you take them out and you're good to go. Uh, once in a while, um, the lucky ones, we would have... Um, Convoys that would go from our base to the green zone and back. If you're lucky enough, you would be able to get on that security detail and you'd be, you'd be able to go to the green zone. That was relaxing because it wasn't, when you go to the green zone, it was like there wasn't even a war going on. That's what made a lot of us mad who were out in, um, you know, our base, you know, fighting all the time, you know, always on edge, this and that. We go to the green zone. They're swimming in the pools, they're riding bikes, they're driving SUVs and everything, and they're all relaxed. You know, they're, they're getting steak and shrimp every night, and, you know, they can... We went into their uh, their PX, their little shop at thing, and there's TVs and refrigerators, and it's like this huge, like, mini mall. We're like, you know, we're grateful for us to be there, because, you know, when you're going, you'd have all, all the soldiers be like, hey, here's some money. You know, get me this, this, and this. So you go out and you buy them all for them. And you're grateful, but then at the same time, you're like, you know, these people, you know, they're not seeing anything. You know, it's like a vacation for them. You know, we're out here, you know, fighting and dying. You know, there's huge, there's always huge tension between a lot of the soldiers seeing combat and um, the people that weren't seeing anything, you know. Uh, even, this even would happen at the brigade. Uh, Base that was relatively close to us. I remember a couple times that um, a lot of us, you know, we're being in combat so much, your uniforms are usually dirty and stuff. We I remember a couple times we would go to the brigade base and uh, you'd have some officer be like, oh, hey, soldier, you know, what's wrong with you? Look at your uniform. It's dirty and this and that. And you just looked at him and you said, I'm from Camp Eagle. That's all you had to say, because they'd be like, oh, oh I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They just leave. Because they knew, they knew, they know about all the fighting that's going on at Camp Eagle. It's, it was everybody talks, all the, the battalion talks, the battalion, the brigades. So everybody knew if you're from Camp Eagle, you know, you're in the shit. You're, you're fighting day and night. So when everybody's trying to give us shit, you know, we just say, we're from Camp Eagle. What do you want from us? And they just leave us alone. It was, it was beautiful. We loved it. <coughs> so that, that was always good. But uh, going from the base to the green zone was sometimes stressful. Uh, find out about Route Irish. It was supposed to be like the most um, heavily IED road in Iraq. You know, uh, I think they call it IED Alley. Maybe I can't remember. Uh, I think we took that road once, <laughs> and then all the other times we took some alternate route to get there. So uh, that that was always you know, stressful. When you know, you know, you're going on certain roads that have a notoriously bad name, you know, for car bombs and stuff. I mean, that's something that we never had to see was the the car bombs, the V beds. You know, and a lot of that was in um, the green zone, surrounding the green zone in some other places. And we just had our IEDs. I mean, one time we're going to leave the green zone. And 
we're about to leave and they said, oh, we're going to be delayed. So we, we had to be delayed for like 10 minutes. And in that 10 minute gap, there was this huge earth shattering explosion. And we finally left and unbeknownst to us, a huge car bomb went off. So as we're driving by, there's this huge hole in the road with like car parts everywhere. We're like, oh, well, if we left on time, that could hit us. You know, so it's one of those things that are, oh, what if? You know, that, that was the only time I saw damage for a, a car bomb. Other than that, you know, never saw any where I was. So, but stress, yeah, it was, oh, most of that tour was, it was, it was just stress. Uh, it's sometimes relaxing. Um, there is a thing called, um, I can remember correctly, Operation Freedom Rest, I want to say. It was in, um, it was in uh, it was in the green zone. It was for uh, like a it was like a little mini R and R. I think he spent like a week, and uh, nobody wanted to go, which was so weird because you know they're asking people, oh, do you want to go? Do you want to go? And everybody was like, no, no, no. They asked me, I'm like, hell yeah, I want to go. And this was in May, so I remember I turned 21 during this, so it's May 15th. So it was like first, it was like the second between the first and second week of May, and they asked me, I'm like, hell yeah, I want to go. I mean, this is awesome. Nice little downtime. And it was for two people in our platoon and nobody else wanted to go. And finally my friend Acevedo, he was like, yeah, I'll go. So we went, we got there and it was just beautiful. They're like, yeah, they're like, you know, there's no rank here. There's no rules. There's nothing. They said, <clears throat> you know, just do whatever you want. You know, it was nice. And it, it, it was actually in one of Saddam's villas. So the, the beds, the rooms were like villas and oh, it was phenomenal. The food was delicious. They had, you know, video games, board games, they had a pool, so we went swimming a little bit. You know, it was just that 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 was, you know, a good a good relax relaxing downtime. Well, yeah. What were you eating back at camp? Was it mainly like key rats and calories <clears throat> or did they have um hot regular meal? When we first got to our base, uh, we didn't have anything set up. MWR wasn't really there yet, so our cooks were cooking. It was it was tea rats at the time, uh, and then MREs. If you're going to be out in the city on patrol for a long period of time, you have your MREs and you just eat your lunch there. Uh, then M MWR got set up, and uh, actually for us it was good food. You know we liked it. We had your you know your fruits your your main food, some desserts, and drinks. We, we'd love it, you know, because, you know, being infantry, you, you don't really get the good stuff sometimes. So, you know, that, that was suffice for us. We we loved it, you know, and they, and it was always, they had, uh, you know, four meal times, your breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then had midnight child for anybody that was going out on missions at night. So they wanted to eat before they went out or if they were coming back in, they could eat something before they went to bed. But then you go to some of these other places, um, you know, we got steak, I think, twice in our, uh, on our base. Some of these places in the green zone and such, they had steak and shrimp every night. They had, we're in the green zone, uh, chow hall. They had different lines for different, especially you had your American, your Italian, your Spanish it was just like what's going on here you know they had just like every type of food imaginable you know I mean you eat good when you're there but you're a little jealous and you go back but then you know you just make do with what you have but you know for the most part yeah the food was good once MWR got set up the food was good so, so your time has pretty much come up it's time for you to your unit, I assume your unit all pulled out together. You did a, a, a change of responsibility and you guys left. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, how did you? I'm sure that was a pretty emotional time being able to find no one again. Yeah, it was. Even, uh, it was funny because the unit that was replacing us was 3rd IV and they were in the invasion. So, when they were coming, you know, to take over from us, we we're like, listen, guys, you know, it's not like an invasion anymore. You know, it's it's a little different, and they're like, "Oh no, no, we got this." We're like, okay, whatever, have fun. But at this time, uh, Mighty Army wasn't really fighting us anymore. Uh, we had our April, May, and June of of sustained combat. 
And then we had like this little peace deal. We had lasted for about a month. And then we started fighting again. I think July and August, we started fighting again. And then that was it. I mean, we killed so many of them. I think they just, there was like, no, we're going to stop fighting you. you know, so there wasn't, when Third ID came in, there wasn't really any fighting going on in our area. But I mean, it was nice. I mean, we had to like triple up though. A lot of our rooms, we had to make room for a third ID to come in. So instead of having two to room, we would have three or four to room. I mean, it was nice, you know, packing up all the stuff. And, you know, finally when they were like, all right, no more patrols anymore. We're like, thank God, you know, we don't have to go out anymore. We can have to just rest. I mean, that was good. Uh, like anything with the army, it's always hurry up and wait. You know, we were saying, oh, this is our day that we're going to leave Iraq. Like, no. Nope. And then they're like, oh, this is the day. We're like, no. Nope. Well, finally, they're like, all right, this is the day. So so all, all of our, um, like, duffel bags and everything, they're already long gone. We put them in connexes con and they were gone. It was just, you know, our weapon, our body armor, our ammo, stuff like that. And you, if you had, like, a small little assault rock or whatnot, you brought that. But uh, they had Blackhawks. And they were going to Blackhawk us from um, our camp to um, the green zone, which was cool. You know, so, you know, the Blackhawks were home finally, you know, we're just cheering. I had like a little camera and, you know, we're in the Blackhawk and I'm, I'm videoing us from going from the ground and leaving the five. I was like, yeah, you know, we're just excited. We were like, ah, fuck you, Cyber City. You know, we're just getting excited. So they Blackhawks for us from there to the green zone. And once there, um, they brought us to um, Baghdad International Airport. So we get there, and that's when we're just basically waiting. I mean, just everybody else is just waiting. That's where you're going in. Uh, you got rid of all your ammo. You handed in all your ammo, all of that stuff. And that, that was just weird. Because because in the beginning of our tour, uh, even before we, we were in Kuwait, you know, you just had your body armor around. We felt it was like, oh, my God, this is so heavy. But after having, you know... 60 70 pounds on the armor weapons and ammo or all your ammo and stuff you take all of that ammo off it was like so light and you're like oh this body armor is nothing now i can just wear this so that was nice and you just had your just your body armor and that was it we was basically sitting on the tarmac waiting we waited a couple days and finally uh we got on our c-130 <laughs> that was beautiful you know get on that c-130 and it flew us down to kuwait so that that was that was a good feeling we we're excited about that you know getting to kuwait so that, i mean that that was good we got to kuwait and it was the same thing you know we went to one of the little camps and you know it was now it was basically cleaning everything and you know clean all your weapons a lot of people would go down to clean the bradleys that had to be uh, shipped back to the states and it was just another waiting game, you know. We were, everything was done. You're just waiting to hear, okay, this is when we're going to go and fly home. And, and you know, there's always rumors that say, oh, it's going to be tonight or it's going to be tomorrow or, you know, oh, this company's going, but this company's going to stay and this one's going first. You know, and word got that I think we left actually, we left a little earlier than anticipated, which was phenomenal. We're like, yeah. So we got on the bus and they, Bust us to that you know, tarmac and got on that plane and oh the plane flying from Kuwait oh god it was just it was beautiful you know cheering and everything and once they said you're now now leaving Iraqi airspace like the whole plane just erupted in chairs we flew the main flew to Maine we got off Maine you know. And once we finally flew into you know, American airspace, you know, another huge chair went. We got off the main, and it was so early that nothing was open. Like the whole, all the shops and everything was, we didn't care. We just, all of us just walking around, just, you know, we're happy. You know, we're, hey, it's, it's American soil and everything. So it was kind of cool. And we got back onto the plane and flew down to Fort Hood and, and that was just, that was phenomenal, you know, we're seeing all the people, we saw a lot of our people that were wounded, like on April 4th, that got shipped back to uh, Fort Hood, so it was, it was nice seeing people that we haven't seen in like a year, it was good handing in your weapons and all that, and 
Then we got bus to the field, uh, the first cav, uh, the vision headquarters field, you know, and that's where we got dismissed. And you see your families and friends, and you know, and take a nice three-day weekend. Much needed. Yeah. Awesome. And then you just you finished out your your commitment there with the army. You finished out your commitment at that time at Fort Hood until you you were ETS. Yeah. Uh, ETS, to, um, I think, 8 July 2005. You know, so, put my paperwork in. That was it. Well, I want to thank you for your, for your time and for your service. Is there anything you want to discuss that we haven't discussed before? Uh, we, we yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I know, like, uh, I felt bad for my, 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 uh, uh, my my family sometimes because of uh, when you get wounded, you know, they have to send the the notification. You know, bad enough when I was you know in basic on nine eleven that uh you know my mom freaked out. You know, I remember nine eleven happened and I had an uncle that worked near the Pentagon, so I got to call to make sure because you know they said if you have anybody that's working in the Pentagon or. World Trade Center around there, you know, call, make sure everybody's okay. So I get to call home and my mom starts crying. She's like, where are you? You know, I'm like, I'm in basic mom. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere, you know. My mom's all emotional. Oh, well, that was fine. But on April 4th, um, was, I, I asked her about this. I'm like, oh, so, you know, when they called you when I was wounded, what happened? And she was like, yeah, you know, I answered the phone and they told me that you were shot and... You know that that's all she was like oh well, is he alive and like we don't know i'm like oh god you know that's you know because the casualty people were all messed up you know so they you know they told my mom i was shot but they couldn't tell her if i was even alive or anything you know so you know she, they're all freaking out you know they don't really know if i'm alive and you know i was and my dad actually had to send a uh, red cross he went through the red cross to send a message to make sure, you know, I can contact them and this and that. So I got, you know, my first time came and said, hey, listen, you know, we got a Red Cross message from your, your dad. You need to contact them immediately and you know, tell them that you're all right. You know, because I think the casualty later on, they told them that, oh, you know, I was shot. I was alive, but we can't tell you anything else. So I called my mom and, you know, she's crying and this and that. I'm like, listen, mom, I'm okay. I'm fine. You know, everything's all right. You know, pretty emotional, but <clears throat> you know, then I got wounded again, and you know, I had to tell her again, "Hey, I was wounded, but I'm okay. You know, I'm all right." You know, so that that was kind of, you know, it kind of sucked. You know, they had to get that information, but you know, thankfully I had to, I got to call them and say, "Hey, you know, you know, I'm all right. You know, don't worry." It kind of sucked that. Hindsight, I probably never should have told them exactly where I was going because we're always in the news. Yeah, yeah. But, um, it's a, a soldier goes deals with a lot of stress for the family back home. They yeah, dealing with their own stress. Yeah, they, they did. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But something that hopefully we they can do better at. Yeah, I hope. But you know, it was it was good though. You know, they kept sending. You know, they always send me care packages and. You know, they spread the word out where I was, so, you know, I was always getting a lot of care packages from friends, family. Uh, I had, like, school children sending me, because I had, you know, was close with some of my teachers, so they would send me, um, uh, like, a huge envelope full of, like, letters from, like, little school children. So, I mean, that was really nice. Always, you know, brighten up your spirits when, you know, you're like, oh, I'm so depressed because of this and all that, but, you know, it was a good you know, hearing from other people, you know, got you through the day. You know, people, most people who've never been in this situation don't quite understand what a simple little cookie from home yeah. can, can lift your day. Oh, yeah, it can. I mean, you know, you got to tell them, you know, don't send chocolate because it'll just come in a huge clump. And sometimes I did get the chocolate and it was just like a big ball of chocolate. But, you know, you just cut it up and tore it a piece and then, you know, just ate it, you know. It does. It does. You know. All right, well, Robert, I want to want to thank you. Uh, thank you for your service, and thanks for, for taking the time for this interview. Thank you. I think you did a good job.